Welcome, everybody. Good evening. I'm Margot Singer from the English department, and it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's reader, our newest member of the English department, Dr. Julia Kolchinsky dasbach First of all, thank you, huge thank you to Megan Hancock and Sam Smith and the Denison Museum for hosting us, and thanks to all of you for coming out for all the Beck series readings and events. We have one more event right after Thanksgiving on Thursday, November 28th, thank you. Um, M.E. O'Brien will be reading at 7 p.m. in Higley Auditorium. And that will wrap up a very busy semester of awesome events. And thanks, of course, to the Harriet Ewens Beck Endowment that has funded readings and residencies by poets and writers here at Denison for almost 60 years. And we're incredibly fortunate to have it enrich our life on campus. Next semester, we actually will regroup here in the library on Valentine's Day with our Great Lakes College's New Writers Award winners, novelist Sering Yangzam Lama and essayist Lars Horn, and then followed by visits from poets Sam Sachs, Brenda Hillman, Roger Robinson. Stay tuned. Tonight's reading is an extra special one, of course, as it is a home series event, which we do when members of the department have new books. And uh, so we're really proud, I just want to say, of our creative writing faculty at Denison. If you're a creative writing person, faculty, yeah, <laughs> give us here. They, we, they work really hard as teachers and mentors, but we're all also practicing publishing literary writers too. Writing is most often invisible labor, as you know students, and it's a lot of labor, as you know, seniors, right? Um, the writer standing before you, I just want to say, in the classroom every day, meeting with you to help you choose your courses, make sure you're taking all your requirements, helping, with you, helping you with your grad school applications, grading your papers, writing you letters of recommendation, or coaching you in fencing. Um, somehow, they're still writing. They're writing when you don't see them, early in the morning, late at night, in the little snatches of time between class, on the weekends alone at their desks, turning sentences around in their heads. You're lucky to have faculty members who get what it means to write, which is to say, to wrestle with the terrible ambiguity of that first draft, to fend off the ever-present doubt and frustration, and to fail and then fail better, as Samuel, Samuel Beckett memorably put it, to persist. Colleges are full of teachers who have more or less given up on writing or writers who don't really care about teaching, and I'm very happy to say that's not who we are here. Julia came to us last year in a pool of well over 100 applicants for the position. These applicants had masters of fine arts degrees, PhDs, published poems, chapbooks, books, often multiple books, teaching experience, years of experience, even tenure at other universities. Their poetry was amazing. Those of us who served on the search committee spent days and days reading their work. It was a tough crowd to stand out in, but Julia did. And when she arrived on campus for her final interviews, some of you met her then, with her characteristic gust of energy and sparkle of great ideas, we knew. Julia's poems are smart, sharp, and powerful. They interrogate language, names, and words, words like war or witness or refugee, the knots of senseless violence and age-old hate, of love and birth and fierce attachments. In Julia's work, the world's horrors are always both too close and too far away. These poems bear witness and insist we look. As she writes in the final quatrain of the Villanelle one year later, quote, how does a house become a shore no news can reach? Are we that cruel? Or is it just that easy to look away from war when the land and people aren't yours? Julia is the author of three books of poetry, The Many Names for Mother, Don't Touch the Bones, and her newest book just out this year, 
40 weeks. Her recent poems have appeared in acclaimed literary journals, including Poetry, Plowshares, The American Poetry Review, and many others. And her nonfiction has been featured in Brevity and the Shenandoah Review. Her recent awards include Hunger Mountain's Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, the Michigan Quarterly Review's Prize in Nonfiction, and a Sustainable Arts Foundation grant. Julia has an MFA in poetry from the University of Oregon, that's the one in Eugene, and a PhD in comparative literature and literary theory from the University of Pennsylvania. For her dissertation, quote, lyric witness, intergenerational recollection of the Holocaust in contemporary American poetry, with a particular focus on the underrepresented atrocities in the former Soviet territories. She's currently working on a poetry collection and also on a book of linked lyric essays which grapple with raising a neurodiverse child with a disabled partner under the shadow of the war against Ukraine, Julia's birthplace. That's a lot. Julia will read for 30 to 40 minutes, after which she'll be glad, I'm sure, to answer any questions you may have and to buy books which are on sale in the back. One favor, there is a play in the black box, uh, the Hilbert Theater, that starts at eight. So you're welcome to hang out in here as long as you want, but when you leave, go quietly because they can hear you. So if you're leaving after eight when the play has started, just be sure to be quiet as you exit. With that, Julia. Am I audible? There I am. Thank you so much, Margot, for that beautiful intro that I now have to work to live up to. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, amid the unfathomable atrocity that is going on locally, globally, I am so grateful that you are all here tonight to share in the space of poetry. It truly means more than you know to have this opportunity to share some about my history and the way I capture it through art. Poetry is not a place of answers and it's not a place of judgment. Rather, it's a place to question and to reach for empathy. For war and water. Everyone is having boys, my mother says. That means war is coming. The way it came in the old country, boys rising out of the ice and cold potato fields, boys laying bricks and digging wells and trenches and bodies, boys out of other boys like my boy, born the year before, cops killed even more black boys, and boys killed other boys for loving boys, and more swastikas showed up on walls, and more walls went up where once ran rivers. But a river is not a boy. A river can either run dry or bleed, and everyone will blame someone, darker or an animal. The gorilla who stole a little boy, or the gator who dragged away another. But in the water, they seem so strong, resilient even. These boys born months apart, these boys who beat the water down, who kick it with their tiny feet as though they're running. These boys who grow, not knowing they were born for war, and that it's everywhere, and there is no outrunning water. So this is going to be a bit of an unconventional poetry reading because I'm going to show you images alongside it and provide a bit of historical context. As a professor here at Denison and being inside of this beautiful teaching museum, I felt that it was the most fitting approach. And I'm going to begin with some poems from my first book, like the one I just shared, then read some newer work responding to the war in Ukraine, and then hopefully end on a bit of a lighter note with my most recent book. Um, so does that sound good? Okay, good. I need the audience engagement. Your section will come at the end. And each, and each, and each, and every each of each and every inch, of each and every each that can be named as each and every each who so much wants each naming. And every naming wants to be an each, 
spanning so much more than inches, and the each of every inch wants each and every naming every time a name falls on a body or a body falls, and each of every body's inches wants a name, and everybody inches towards the only thing contagious more than laughter is grief. So my own motivation for writing um, emerges in large part coming from a history and an ancestry of trauma. Um, here is a very early photo of my great-grandmother Vera and my great-grandfather Sima or Simcha or Simon. He went by many names. Um, and in June of 1941, when Hitler invaded the former Soviet Union and tanks crossed across the steppes of Ukraine, my great-grandfather arranged for my great-grandmother, along with my then two-month-old grandmother, their older child and two sets of aging grandparents, to be evacuated into the Ural Mountains, which are, I know, map and geography is hard, so here it is. <laughs> all the way down there in contemporary day Uzbekistan, so all the way from Kiev, um, they took trains to get to the southern region. Um, this is the last photo that I have of them together, and I only have those two photos. Um, and my great-grandfather did not go into evacuation. He, in fact, stayed back in Kiev to fight as a partisan, which were unofficial militia fighters. And the circumstances around his death are very uncertain. My great-grandmother returned to Kiev while the city was still under bombardment to look for him, and he was nowhere to be found. And then she heard from a friend or a neighbor or someone that he was taken by the SS, that he was turned in for being a Jew, and some say they saw him dragged away, some say they didn't see him at all, he was there one day and gone the next. The only certainty is his absence. My family suspects that he was likely murdered in Babinyar, the largest two-day massacre uh, of Jews, where in the span of two days, more than 33,000 were murdered, and the Execution that occurred in the former Soviet territories is very different from the concentration camp narrative that is more well known, where death was done by shooting squad in very close proximity and often by others who lived in the region, who were enlisted by the SS to participate. Um, so they would be lined up, executed, and bodies would fall on top of bodies, and then the bodies would be burned to make room for more. His name, however, is missing from any archive that I've scoured, looking in Poland, in the Holocaust Museum here in DC, which has access to all the Soviet archives. Um, this is an image that I took from Poland's big book of names exhibit, where I finally thought I would find his name, um, but it was in fact missing. So the next poem I'm gonna share with you is, um, deals with some of my grandmother's first memories when she returned to Kiev. And she was five years old, at, no, less, she was three. Um, but she remembers nooses swinging and um, Nazi soldiers executed. Simcha, the prize, the beloved, the listener, the boundary for one, or maybe all of us. His name is not carved into a plaque lit up by an eternal flame, nor did we find it in a book that lists all those who burned or fell away from bone. When I read you the Babin Yar list of names and his was missing, did you remember your return to Kiev, the unburied city where nooses swung suspended from trees and telephone poles, where handmade ropes strangled out the breath from necks in uniform, left men dangling for days while survivors watched December's frost flake away and take with it the hanged men's skin? Men who wouldn't be laid to rest in the bread basket soil alongside the thousands they heaved into it. Vera, you had no place to pray over the loss of unrecorded body. Even from this American coast, I see the dust that looms above that frozen ground, living entombed beneath the dead. If only their breath could melt the deepening snow, show us where to dig for all the missing and let your daughter stop waiting for her father 
to come home. So today um, is actually the 85th anniversary of Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass, um, where all across Nazi Germany in 1938, 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed, 900 synagogues were burned, nearly 100 were murdered, and 30,000 were sent to the concentration camps. With xenophobia on the rise, the next poem I'll share was written on this day back in 2016 the day after the election, when there was also a huge influx of anti-Semitism, bomb threats to Jewish community centers and preschools, and violent hate crimes. Um, this photo is of a street I used to walk in Philadelphia, pushing my son in his stroller. The night glass broke the heart, November 9th, 2016. Oh, and the other thing to note is yesterday was my son's uh, birthday. So November 8th is his birthday. That's referenced in this poem. I ate my son's leftover birthday cake for breakfast and listened to him cry. Walked the dog and picked up after her and it rained everywhere. Spent hours in a coffee shop where Bob Dylan played like it was already tomorrow. Called my mother and told her it was dreadful out. Knew it, but looked out the window. My mother told me she was scared to lose her job. I told her I was scared too, to lose everything. Told her there are swastikas on abandoned shop windows blocks away, and it is only morning. The streets growing full and heavy and not ours. And still, if I saw hate through glass, I'd know that it was hate, and I'd name it and point and call her to say, I saw hate on the street and called it out for being hate. While Philadelphia keeps calling itself the city of brotherly love and everywhere someone is trying to love, but love is glass, ancient, five millenniums of melting sand grounds to something we can see through. Look, I say to my mother, and she hangs up the phone. The pavement is shattered with puddles. Look, I say to my son, look out the window, hate staring back at us, unbreaking, but he doesn't see it yet and holds me tighter and loves, knowing only how to hold its broken name. My family fled Ukraine um, after the fall of the Soviet Union as Jewish refugees, after Ukraine had gained her independence by a referendum that was supported by 93% of the population. Um, we fled a place that was very different from the Ukraine of the last, I would say, 20 years. Um, it was a place where we were marked in Soviet times as Jews on our passports, and with that marking, many privileges were restricted or completely taken away. The next poem was written on the 25th anniversary of our immigration, and in just a few days, we're coming up on 30 years in America. <clears throat> and here is where I'm from in Ukraine, maps, it's hard to visualize. So I'm from the city called Dnipro, my dad is from Odessa, and then um, other members of my family are from Kyiv. 25 years later, my mother's still unsure we should have come. You've never really suffered, she reminds me, as though it were a flaw. You don't know what it means to be a Jew, to be a family. She calls us broken, writes something about fragmented shards on Facebook, and hopes we feel how much our distance hurts her. I try responding with something about faith, tikkum olam, and making whole again. Don't use that zaumni language America has taught you. Highfalutin, obtruse, pretentious, obscure. The word in Russian breaks down to beyond the mind. You always belittle me, she says, point out my flaws, but I'd like to see you make it in Ukraine. She thinks I'd know then what it means to be a Jew. Once I've been named or beaten, thinks I would never have left home so young, thinks I'd be afraid the way she is, and fear would make me love her harder and teach me what a Jewish family is. If we had to do it now, she says, all 10 of us leave everything we know and cross the waters to survive, I know we wouldn't make it. 
She cries, thinks of her brother, how far away he lives now and refuses to come visit, cries harder, believes my distance is her punishment. At least one of us, she says, is happy that we came. Now, since the full-scale invasion of February 24th, 2022, she is very grateful that we came. We are all very grateful. And I think she was grateful then, too, but it was a complicated sort of grateful. Um, but the war did not start in 2022. And in fact, it started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the fighting that broke out in the east in the Donbass regions by Russian-backed separatists. Um, but on February 24th, the full-scale invasion began with bombs falling across all of the country's major cities and tanks marching on its capital. The next poem I'm going to share was written on that day and mentions um, a show some of you might know called Masha and the Bear. And if you don't know it, it's on Netflix with English dubbing. So you can check it out. It's pretty hilarious. It's also important to note that although Ukrainian became the official government language in 1991, they didn't start teaching it in schools until 1993. And quite cursory, I would say. Um, as Ia Kiva, if you were at her reading, she talked about the way that even though Ukrainian was the official language, most of the literature being taught was still Russian literature. Um, so most people who emigrated in the 90s, <laughs> like my family, our first language is Russian. And it's the language of the oppressor. Watching Masha i Medved as Russia invades Ukraine. Mishka, nu Mishka, blares in Russian through one ear as CNN coverage of the first day missiles falling on my birthplace echoes through a blue earbud in the other. My children are on the couch drinking their morning milk and stuffing their mouths full of warm croissants watching a blonde Slavic girl wrap a giant bear around her finger. Mishka, she tenderly calls, little bear, and he reluctantly does whatever is asked, prepares elaborate meals of kashas with dried fruits and homemade cherry, currant, gooseberry preserves and stroganoffs and stews and smoked fish with five kinds of potatoes. And if she but whispers in her small, high-pitched voice, Mishka, he will carry her and a menagerie of animals across a swamp to a field of wildflowers to safety. More missiles fall on Kiev. The airport in the city I was born is bombed. I don't remember it. My Dnipro, the home where I collected chestnuts by the Dnieper River or ate small spheres of ice cream from a shop called Pingvin or held my mother's hand when the streets flooded and she lifted me up to walk the rim of rusted fountains. Incoming call from Dom, meaning home, interrupts the news. Mama tells me she's finally reached her childhood friend. They spoke as shells fell, and maybe Marina could see fires through her window. My mother never thought this would happen. None of us did. The subway stations turned bomb shelters the way they were in the war her parents lived through and grandparents died fighting. Not while there are those still alive to remember, she said. How could he do this while they are still alive? She repeats it to her mother, over tea and tears and disbelief. Ice falls in Arkansas. And my children demand another snack and episode of Masha in their mother's tongue, my mother tongue. This mouthful of history we chew and chew until it chokes us. <clears throat> When last winter in Ukraine, the power was out daily and for hours on end, we in Arkansas, <laughs> and I'm sure in many places in America, lit trees and lit up our houses um, as across the water bombardments continued and still do. The Ukrainian flag stares through the balsam fir from Larry's farm. Just take it, he said, and I doubted generosity. Are you sure? Still $30 short, I've learned nothing is free in this country. His white mustache curled to a smile. I'm Larry, 
and this is the south, and these are my trees. How easy to claim what soil gives, to own trees and bodies, to give them away to strangers, so my children can hang the shatterproof ornaments and ask for more light. While in Ukraine, the bulbs won't spark and heat won't radiate, the soil will stay snow-covered and theirs. And in my house, strings and strings of electric rainbow dazzle trail the evergreen and walls and wind my children's small limbs. Here, it's barely cold enough to light a fire, but we can and do. With oak and crab apple, we home its added glow, so everything smells of invited smoke and pine, not invaded smoking sky, where the windows flicker with candlelight and shellings. And tomorrow, I will bake gingerbread and fry latkes and light the candles forbidden in my Soviet childhood. Tomorrow, I will pray to a God I almost don't believe in for more miracle. Tomorrow, I will still have been born from darkness and wick. And tonight, when I lift my daughter to place the silver star on the highest branch and my American mother-in-law takes a photo, the only light will be the yellow-blue horizon of the flag frozen in the window behind us. And this brings us to an exhibit that we have right here in the Denison Museum, and one I encourage you to explore after the reading. Oh, oh no, we lost connection. I don't know how to make it return. But it's, the, it's pictures of the exhibit, so it's like right there, which is exciting. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not too detrimental. Um, so it features the work of artist Olga Marozova and her students in Kiev. And you can see their sketches from metro stations uh, that they were doing while air raids were going on. You can see Olga's large-scale canvases as well as small canvases showing that life continues under air raids and bombardments. And you can see her series called Made in Darkness, where she did a pastel for every time the power went out. And there are now, something's still happening. And there are now, huh, touch it. That's exciting. You love when someone tells you to touch something. Um, so the QR code that you see visible here is actually a code that allows you to purchase the original works if you would like to purchase them or prints. And you can purchase prints and they'll be delivered right to your house. So, And the funds go straight to Ukraine if you want to support. <clears throat> One year later, it's easy to look away from war when your wallet's empty and the sink is full, when the land and people aren't yours, when your children scream for more of you, when your body's pulled. It's easy to look away from war. The soil across the water to Earth's core brims blood, but look, the sunflowers still bloom when the land and people aren't yours. So. You focus on the daily chores. Dig out a trench of laundry, linens, wools. It's easy to look away from war with the dog barking, mailman at the door. Your children speak a stranger's tongue at school. The land and people aren't yours. How does a house become a shore no news can reach? Are we that cruel? Or is it just that easy to look away from war when the land and people aren't yours? And also on display in that very room is Dear Ukraine, which is a global community poem that I was asked to write just a week after uh, the full-scale invasion began. And it's a poem that invites you to respond to the conflict. And you can respond in English, but also in Ukrainian and in Russian and in Polish. And your responses can be translated. And they are up on the web and join a chorus of global voices from all across the world. And in that room, you can print out your response and put it on the wall. And you can join the voices right here at Denison. So I'm going to read you the short poem and encourage you to respond in your own time. Dear Ukraine, I'm so far from your earth, your dead, your suffering. This expanse is nothing but a singing wound. Still, I reach for you, Ukraine, as I drive my children to daycare and sob in my car, then go on with the day while you tug and tear at me, Ukraine, 
thorn, anchor, stone, seed. I want your sunflowers to rise across the water, fields and fields ablaze. They'll burn anyone who dares to cut them down. Dear Ukraine, you are snowfall and ash. Your water vapor and smoke hang heavy in the air. Even here, they soak the earth. Take shelter, if only in this song and soil, if only for a moment. Take shelter here. Bone Appendix. Trace your son's left hand against construction paper with a non-toxic marker, teaching him the edges of his bones. Then fill the space between with what shines or powders, glitter, crushed Cheerios, even flecks of skin, teaching him his bones remain in spite of it. Let him try to fit his finger in the contours tomorrow or the next day, teaching him his bones keep growing. And when he makes two fists, afraid his body can't keep up with what's inside, clenching hard as teeth to keep his bones just as they are, to keep them from sprouting out, tell him of the oldest Ukrainian apple tree that grows its branches low into the ground until they drink the soil, an indiscernible colony of roots or eternally new trees. And when he's falling asleep, pressed against your chest, trace his right hand against the treehouse ribcage it first grew in, teaching him the endlessness of bones. And so this brings us to the shelter of a mother's body, carrying and protecting her child. And to my book, 40 Weeks, where I wrote a poem for each week of pregnancy. And um, I... Oh, that was loud. That was an announcement for those waning. Um, I wrote a poem for each week of pregnancy, and there, uh, after the fruit, nut, seed, vegetable that the baby size is compared to, and you can sign up to get these delightfully uh, delightful, but also problematic in the way they objectify and gender the body emails. So now this is the audience participation portion. Would you like grape or lime? Call it out. Oh, oh my gosh, this is really tenuous. All right, grape. Okay, Gr okay, all right, grapes. I, this seems strong, strong, strong for grape. Okay, grape. We're there, we're there for grape. <clears throat> Week nine, grape. Louse, the singular form of lice small, wingless, you'd never heard of because you never find just one. Like the note from your son's school saying one girl has them and she's been treated and you should check every tangle of your son's curls to make sure some haven't found their way inside. And another mother says she'd buzz it all off just to be safe. Says he's a boy, so he'll look tougher anyways. And you recall how you were three then too when your parents nearly shaved you and the other kids wouldn't share the bench, would run away and yell and point, would laugh how you were infected and dirty and a louse ruined Jewish. So you'll refuse to cut his hair and scour each perfect ringlet, twist their multitudes around your fingers. And when you find only more locks, you'll tell him, to sit with Evelyn tomorrow, to remind her she is beautiful and loved. Okay, for the sake of time, I mean, I guess we have time. This is such a great image. Do we want coconut or spaghetti squash? Wow, I love that I have never had a reading where I let people choose and there's so much tension. Coconut. Spaghetti squash. So the spaghetti squash people are like more excited, but there are more coconuts. I'm just, I'm saying, I, I, I heard. Um, 
Okay, so this this poem references um, a candy bar that is much like a Mounds or an Almond Joy, but it's a bounty if you've ever had that uh, European candy bar. And this poem um, references also like one of my um, uh, first, and one of my few memories in Ukraine. Um, we're at a, a very hot bazaar that I'll talk about, and we're selling all of our stuff. And I have to be there with my parents, and I'm five and miserable. Um, also references, for those who have been pregnant in the room, that fun glucose testing that happens where they, you know, poke your blood. So if you fail the first test, you got to do it again, and then they poke you four times. Okay. A lot of context. Week 31, coconut. Four times they drew, checking blood for sweetness. How quickly the body can dissolve what feeds it. Glucose, meaning sweet wine, simple, meaning how much of it hides inside the coconut's husk. Its tender white meat flesh, its milk, the creamy clear colostrum, the same as your seed nut fruit dark droop nipples seep each time you shower or mistake a noise for children's crying. You vomited the first time, five years old, and biting its shredded meat dried flakes surrounded by dark chocolate. You feel it even now, sand between your teeth, sickness rising, remembering bounty, the candy bar treat so you'd endure an other hour in the market. Ukraine's summer heat, your bountyless childhood, everything for sale to make departure sweeter. You've refused it since, the stick and sweet of it, You've let go anything you own, your blood and choice, to eat a bountiful pint of imported German ice cream. Impossible in your insoluble childhood. All right, you got one more choice. Cantaloupe or pumpkin? Pumpkin. Wow, that was uniform. That was uniform. (laughs) All right, I guess it is the season. That makes sense. All right, so pumpkin um, references something that there's... Did I kill the mic? No, it's there. Okay. Um, References, it's great that you chose pumpkin because there's an exhibit in this room about the exclusion zone of Chernobyl. And this poem references Chernobyl, which is the nuclear catastrophe um, that sent radiation all around Ukraine. And the people in Dnipro, where we lived, were very lucky because the winds blew that radiation cloud north. And so all our family from Kiev evacuated to Dnipro, which was safer from the radiation. Um, but Kiev got hit with a lot of radiation. <clears throat> Week 40, pumpkin. Summer solstice stings the Philly skyline after an oil refinery explosion turned clouds to lanterns as you watched your newborn scream, her body pulsing violet from needle pricks, they stuck and stuck again, draining her garnet apple heels to check your blood hadn't scorched hers. The lethal mixing of opposing blood types your mother feared would turn you infertile after your firstborn. But you don't fear what your body can do to each other's. Don't fear the red or yellow you can see ignite her skin, the bilirubin rising amber glow around her iris, the danger to her body having come from yours. Oh, the pumpkins are gone again, how sad. Don't breathe, worn friends from out of state, afraid the air is poison, but you know there's no escaping what's above the skin or what's below. The year before you were born, Ukraine's sky seethed radioactive too, and you imagined a bear ate the stars. You tore open its name, Chernobyl, Chorna, Bol, Black Pain, imagined mothers watching in awe as light fell from the bear's mouth into their children's, imagined how some closed their vents and blinds and mouths, afraid of flying ash, constellations doused dark more terrified of what's been made invisible. But everyone who inhaled suffered all the same, bare blood boiling slowly from inside. Generations of infertile women and children lost among the stars. Here with your daughter, not 48 hours old, you tear her name apart too, 
Remy Loray, one who rows a crooked river, a cavern, the sky, one who lures your body to remember. Her hot, hungry mouth roves for your star-cracked nipple. Remy opens fearless tea candle eyes, gulps colostrum, lurid, blood-laced, to protect her from generations of blazing air. She's unaware, already flame inside her. And I'm going to end with one final poem that you don't get a choice in, but it's sad that the image went away, because if I tap it, will it come back? Oh. I didn't do enough slides, so they disappeared. Um, maybe the image will come up. Why have children when the world is ending? Killer whales have stopped reproducing. Polar bears are eating their cubs. Koalas abandon their young, breathless, nose low to the brush to keep from choking on rising smoke. They run towards the thousands, pounds of food we airdropped, where earth stopped burning or flames just hadn't reached yet. Guilt for our part in this end or fear it would come for us the same. We tell ourselves everything just wants to survive. Believe in life as circle, not line, in karma, if it means our endurance. We spread stories about wombats herding animals into their burrows, kangaroos hugging their rescuers, or foxes feeding barby bears uncharred candy milk. But animals know to rely on no one. Their own scathed hides and carcasses pile the roadside along bus routes to the local preschool. The children we chose to have must fight, gagging at the smell. My infant daughter screams at us for plugging the bulb syringe deep into her nostril. She exhales snot mixed with my milk, screams again, then sleeps. She doesn't know we have made this quiet possible. She turns her head away where breathing comes easiest and reaches for a warm body as soon as she can smell it close. She doesn't know the coral reefs are dead and sargassum reeks in mounds along Caribbean coastline, starfish suffocated under its spreading. And maybe this is why we've made her, because she doesn't know survival is in our hands, forgives us their indiscretion, and lets us hold her as though her body were a world we could still save. Thank you so much. <laughs>
and I show that. I'm like, there, I had nothing. Weeks five, there's just nothing. There was nothing in me to put on the page. And when I revised the book, you know, I, I, these other books, and we're talking about revision right now, are heavily revised. I spent so much time writing and rewriting. With this book, I wanted to stay true to the experience and ephemerality of both parenting and pregnancy. And I let the poems be their messy selves. So see, that's why you're like, uh, what do pumpkins really have to do with Chernobyl? I don't know, I let it be messy. It's messy, I had just given birth. I wrote a poem 42 hours after giving birth. So I was like, you know what? I was in the hospital writing it. So I was like, even if it's not all that connected, I believe in it. <laughs> if there are no other questions, thank you so much. Please linger. Please see the exhibits. If you would like me to sign a book, I would be glad to. Um, and I'm just so grateful to share in this space with you and hope that you're like, ooh, I'm going to do a prompt about a fruit or a veggie. So go forth and write. <laughs>